much. Okay, so I'm going to try and um, bring it all down into about 20 minutes, so hopefully I can do it justice. So today I'm going to be talking about... Oh, this wants to start. Maybe, maybe not. Here we go. Uh, programs that are changing uh, animal shelter facility design, so things that we're seeing both here in Australia and overseas. Uh, how to reduce the length of stay by creating a healthy environment for the animals. So I heard that's been talked about a fair bit this week, um, about reducing that length of stay in shelters. How to design for efficient flow and operations. Uh, operation costs are such a big part of every uh, operating shelter. Designing the facility to encourage volunteers to come in and work in your shelter. So have it as a, an environment that encourages that. How to encourage adoptions and public visitations. How to make it more of a destination for the family to come and find their perfect pet. And how to discourage adoption returns by creating a less stressful environment. So we just heard that uh, by Cece. So there's a number of programs that um, we're seeing, and uh, both here and, and overseas, um, which is affecting how we look at designing animal shelters. So I heard foster care is one. That's certainly one that uh, we're seeing really taking up here in Australia, which is great. Reduce the need to house the animals long-term in shelters. Uh, outer shelter rehoming via rescue and community groups. Uh, managing your admissions, uh, no doubt that's been talked about this week as well. Uh, reducing inefficiencies within the shelter and streamlining operations. And looking at adoption demand. So some animals are in more demand than others, as you would well know. Uh, something I witnessed quite a lot happening in the US, and um, that may have been talked about already as well this week. Uh, moving animals from shelter to shelter. Um, I think there was um, chihuahuas was the the trend a couple of years ago. There was uh, certain parts of California that loved chihuahuas. I don't know why that was, but uh, but uh, anyway, uh, Hollywood I think had something to do with it. So. Uh, yeah, so they were moving chihuahuas around the US um, to where they were to be adopted. Um, and that program worked really well, from what I saw. So also looking at fast-tracking high-demand uh, animals to the adoption floor. How do we get the animals that are in high demand, get them onto the adoption floor as soon as possible? And as I mentioned, uh, transferring between shelters and other groups as well. So all these things have an impact on how we look at um, designing animal shelters. Okay, some of the steps to think about um, when designing a new or expanding uh, an existing animal shelter. Um, something that we do a lot of work with, with our clients is really defining those goals, understanding exactly what it is you're trying to do, um, because none of this is cheap. Designing and building a facility is not cheap. Um, so you want to make sure you get as right as you can um, in day one. Um, I'll also warn that you can never get it 100% right. <laughs> if you think you're going to get a facility that's absolutely perfect, um, you're kidding yourself. There's always something that you could do better. Um, but to try and eliminate that as much as possible, is, uh, it's all through design, defining your goals clearly. Uh, addressing the numbers, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Addressing stress in animals and in staff. Determining animal housing needs and non-housing needs as well. So clearly defining what support things you need for the, the housing of the animals. Looking at retail, some retail theory. Um, featuring product, companions, communicating value and limiting the display. And I'll cover these off again in more detail. The five senses. Uh, we all have them. So I'll go through those as well. The sixth sense, hiring people, people. So often I uh, walk into an animal shelter and you know, the person that's at the reception desk is obviously having a bad day. Um, and, and so you've got to be very careful of that and very aware, certainly as managers or uh, you know, people who run these shelters, 
um, to realise if someone's having a bad day, you probably need to put someone else at the front counter. Um, and also about being transparent and being authentic in what your message is. And I'll go and I'll show you some of those. And really focusing on that adoption experience. And what is the overall impression you want to give? Um, is it welcoming, positive messages, you know, lightness, brightness, humour? Uh, it's amazing how humour can really play quite a key role. Um, and welcoming the community into your shelter. So defining your goals. Um, now this is quite a common theory. Um, you probably have seen it all before. But really is to break down everything you're trying to do into smaller, more manageable processes, understanding them, working out is there alternatives, assessing those alternatives, and then coming back, you know, uh, asking why more than once. <laughs> For everything you're looking to do, asking why 10 times, 20 times, um, until you've exhausted, yes, that's the, definitely the reason we want to do this and why we want to do this particular bit of work. Um, setting goals, you need to be smart, and uh, I've put that there. Be very specific, make it measurable, make it attainable. So many people say, oh, we want to build this new facility and, oh, it's going to cost all this money, which, which you know, you're never going to be able to afford. So maybe break it down into more bite-sized things that you can do. Make it obviously relevant and uh, put a time period on it. Okay, understanding capacity. So, you know, what is your current metric of adoption animals per head of population? Um, so many people I ask that question, they go, I don't know. I've never actually looked at it that way. Um, but for the population that exists in your, in your local area, you know, how many dogs, cats, whatever, are you adopting out per head of population? So is it two to four adoptions per 1,000 people? Is it five to eight? Is it eight to ten? What do you want to, what's your goal? Where do you want to be? Because these sort of numbers help us determine, you know, the size of this facility that it needs to be. You obviously don't want to build something too small or certainly too big. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about stress um, on dogs and cats, and I've got some statistics here as well. But, you know, the environmental effects, um, the, the environment itself, the shelter, affects the behaviour and the stress levels of both people and the animals. So, you know, this one over here, you can see all the, the dogs can all see each other across the, the small corridor there. Um, so you can imagine the aggression that's, uh, that's going on or, in some cases, dogs sort of hiding in a corner somewhere uh, versus this one, which is using visual barriers to stop them seeing uh, dogs looking across and seeing other dogs or seeing them out in yards playing or whatever the case may be. Um, just stopping dogs from seeing other dogs outside or seeing other dogs right opposite them can actually reduce your noise levels by around 50%. Um, we've seen that over and over again. Uh, this was an um, uh, article produced in the Journal of Feline Medicine in the US in 2009, looking at upper respiratory tract disease in cats the, during the length of stay that they're in a shelter. So as you can see, you know, as time goes on, um, you know, the, the Justin looked good for cats. I think that uh, goes on from where Cece was just talking about. But it's uh, really important that we really reduce the stress on dogs and cats um, in that shelter environment and, uh, and move them in and out as quickly as we can. Um, so this is maybe familiar. <laughs> um, so this is Oregon Humane Society. Uh, went there a number of years ago. And just simple things like having a routine is so important to ensuring that um, you know, dogs, cats, whatever it is, have a regular routine. Um, they know they're going to be getting out for a walk. So in this case here, uh, you know, um, Oregon Humane Society used different colours to help volunteers and help their own staff uh, in walking, the, have a dog walking program every day. Um, really good, effective way, visual way. I love visual stuff. It really works well. People seem to understand visual. Um, you, know, you give them a procedure and they won't follow it. You give them something like that and they tend to follow it. Um, so uh, reducing stress, o obvious one is don't crowd. Um, don't have a shelter bursting from the seams. Um, you know, follow current guidelines. You know, every state here in Australia has uh, certain guidelines. Some have very poor ones, others have very good ones. 
Um, you know, keep it quiet. Keep the facility quiet as much as possible. Uh, bring in natural light. Natural light is always good for us as humans. It's also very good for animals. Uh, and providing good fresh air throughout the facility all the time. Uh, so this was, again, another paper that was actually done by UC Davis, University of California, um, uh, around crowding, and I recommend people who are looking to uh, do facility design for their animal shelter to have a look at that. Uh, it's a very good um, article, um, really covers off a lot of things around um, crowding and some of the stresses and other issues that exist. Um, discouraging adoption returns by creating that less stressful environment because if you put a dog or a, da a cat out with someone who's adopted it and that's already stressed, dog or cat, chances are they probably won't last too long with that adoptee. They'll probably come back. So obviously having them less stressed is good. Um, cat housing, um, there's again, every state has something different. Um, when we're looking at designing facilities here in Australia or, or even in New Zealand, um, we try and look at um, what is the most stringent and then say, well, we should be at least an absolute minimum being that. Here in Australia, it's the Victorian Code. Um, and they cover off different things. Um, the Victorian Code has had a lot of input from industry. Uh, most of the animal welfare organisations were involved, the, the AVA, uh, so a lot of industry was involved in this. Um, and they cover off different types of housing for cats. So here's an example of a cat condo, which is what they classify as a transitional um, uh, unit. Um, has ventilation built in, um, so there's no cross-contamination of diseases. Uh, here's another example of a walk-in, they call that a module, um, so where you, you physically can walk into it. The cat has various levels of, uh, of accommodation. Um, again, this one has ventilation system all across the top, so it's extracting air constantly from uh, within those modules, so we're not relying on natural air just flowing if the wind's blowing that day. Uh, another example from Oregon Humane Society, um, which is a cat well, colony pen, they call that, here in Australia. Uh, we have a number of cats um, all together in, in the one colony. Uh, and as I said, various shelters like this and don't like this, and it's all about the management of the cats and obviously the length of stay and, and all those sort of things that you're looking at when you're looking at colony pens. Some quick fixes for cats. Uh, the first one is uh, masking the noise. Um, using electronic masking devices such as background music, water features. Water features are really good um, for cats. Um, I went to Washington Animal Rescue League um, a couple of years ago and they had this, this amazing water feature that the cats actually play in. <laughs> it's really quite amazing. Uh, it was great. It was very calming. Um, sound absor absorptive materials in the room. Um, new caging or enrichments. So consider warm materials like fiberglass cages. So instead of stainless steel, if you're looking at caging, um, hospital grade, cat condos, walk-in runs, all those sort of things are, are new ways of looking at caging of cats. Um, quiet latches, soft closing hinges, all these are good things that, you know, stopping that banging, the noise, all those sort of things for cats. Um, exhaust fans, um, you know, we always recommend trying to do about 10 to 12 air changes every hour from the enclosure, so that's not the whole room, that's just focusing on uh, moving air through and out of the, uh, the actual enclosure. Uh, having windows and pleasant views for the cats to look out on, not looking at other cats. Cats get very stressed looking at other cats. Um, so getting the, giving them something else to look at. Um, keeping cats housed, who are housed individually from seeing each other. Um, we always keep them at least one and a half to two metres away because uh, uh, we've certainly done the research and found that that works best um, for cats. <coughs> dogs, so guidelines for dog housing, um, again very state by state, country by country, uh, again we take Victoria's, <laughs> okay. uh, they're the most uh, stringent. So some examples here, uh, again these, these dogs they, they can't, they're looking onto a wall, um, they can't actually see other dogs, um, this is one example. Um, this one here is AWL New South Wales, for those of you who are from there. 
Um, these lot are looking out onto nice landscaping, again, not looking onto other dogs. Uh, some quick fixes for dogs. So again, new pens are in, and other forms of enrichment, giving them time to get out and, and get outside that, that poor pen that they're in all the time so they don't get kennel crazy, go kennel crazy. Uh, more exercise areas, um, not in direct view of other dogs. Um, installing visual barriers between the dogs. Uh, noise baffles, dividing the room up, um, some simple things that you can do. Uh, again, masking noise. Um, and by the way, there's a little trick there. Harp music is really, really good for dogs. Um, I went to um, Houston SPCA and they have harp music going all the time. And uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd go bonkers with it. But, uh, but it was amazing just how calm the dogs were. It really was. Uh, fresh air improvements, always think about that as well. Uh, so good ventilation, natural light, you know, always making sure, taking advantage of, you know, east-west light coming in, um, prevailing winds, making sure we're looking at where, whenever we're designing any shelter, we're always looking at all those aspects, uh, making sure we're moving air in, in through the pens themselves and out. Uh, creating a pleasant experience, uh, stressed out animals are not very adoptable. Uh, they do as much as you can within your budget limitations to present happy, healthy, loving, caring for companions. And ideas include uh, creating socialisation spaces for those volunteers to come and interact, uh, giving the animals defensible space. That's really, really important. Quite often I just go into a shelter and there's nowhere for a dog to get away. You know, they're just, they're just always in this adversarial relationship with a dog across the aisle. Um, Putting best flow, airflow in, and I covered that off. So here's an example. This is Lost Dogs Home in North Melbourne where they wanted us to relook at their cat adoption. Um, so that's what they had before. Um, all the cats could see each other, very stressed. They had a lot of upper respiratory diseases. Uh, and now we've put the condos in and they've seen a 40% increase in adoptions as well. So it's actually good for the people coming to adopt. Featuring product. <laughs> I'm sure there's not too many adoptees coming in like that, although you probably wouldn't encourage it either. Uh, featuring companions, so trying to provide an environment that looks really nice, that, that, that the adoptees can look and see, understand what that, what that cat or that dog will look like in their environment. Communicating value, some of these things, I mean, these obviously look expensive, they don't have to be. Polished concrete, you know, in certain areas can be very, very effective. Just, but again, just don't go overboard with it. Um, some timber features, you know, just make it look more homely in some cases. Communicating value. Um, again, um, the photo on the left is um, an animal shelter in, I'm trying to think now where it is. I think it's, um, uh, I've lost it. The one on the right is San Diego SPCA. I just love the dog chasing the cat. I think that's really quite uh, humorous. Um, and right behind there is actually where you surrender your dog or your cat. So it was really interesting that they're trying to obviously show something else there. Limiting the display. So this is Apple. Uh, for those of you who have been into an Apple store, you'll see they, they limit their display. They only have certain things on display, but out the back they've got a, boxes and boxes of product, and it's amazing how many of their products walk out their door every day. So when we're looking at an animal shelter, and we, it doesn't really matter on the size, we try and limit the number of dogs and cats that are available for adoption in terms of what the public see. We certainly have what we call healthy hold, which is an area behind that which has got a lot of other dogs or cats waiting to be adopted. Um, but us as humans, we're, we're very pathetic when it comes to making a decision. Um, you know, so limiting that display makes it a lot easier for you to, uh, for the adoptees to make a decision. Um, but keeping in mind there's a lot of others behind the scenes ready for adoption. So I'm going to rush through this last bit because I've been told I already have only a couple of minutes left. Uh, so the five senses. See, people being able to see. Uh, what I loved about Oregon Humane Society is they have... These, these areas where you can see volunteers in there with cats, but right next to them there's other cats in cages. Um, and so you're sort of appealing to both ends of the spectrum, in a way. Um, here, making it as quiet as possible when the people are coming in so they don't walk in and go, oh my God, that's too loud, I'm walking back out the door. It's 
smell, um, and I've covered off, you know, making sure that we're extracting air from the enclosure area, not from the public spaces. So again, touch. So where necessary, where it's a good thing to do, puppies, kittens, <laughs> the public love touching those, but don't put them at the front. Put them down the back. You know, the ones that are harder to adopt, put them right up the front. <laughs> it's a bit like going for the milk in the supermarket. You know, it's always down the back. So again, just sitting there. I mean, that, I love that picture. Um, a person sitting there on a very tall dog. <laughs> Taste, again, it's, uh, it's amazing. Um, I said making it more of an experience for the people coming in to adopt really works well. Having an area for them to sit and reflect, is this the right decision to make? Uh, having a coffee, you know, that really works well. Hiring people, people, <laughs> very important. Make sure you hire people that uh, are very good at communicating, very good at listening. We're born with two ears and one mouth. Listen. <laughs> and the sixth sense uh, being transparency and authenticity. So this is an animal shelter that was actually uh, running a course right in the reception area. Um, so really good. How's that one? Interesting. Um, so yeah, so again you can, uh, from reception, you can look in and see um, that, that uh, doctor there. Transparency. Um, so this is from the public area looking in and seeing them doing spay and neuters. Um, and this wasn't Oregon, this was another one I took a photo of, but Oregon does it as well. Uh, having information available for people to look at, you know, having good signage, all those sort of simple things. You know, it doesn't have to be solar, although at one point we, we certainly had uh, a good program going in Australia, but solar is certainly not the answer. But there's other good things, you know, water, good water saving measures, all those sort of things for authenticity. So it's all about that adoption experience, you know, uh, walk in the door with a fresh set of eyes and look at your place or take your best friend in who's not involved in this industry. Bring them in with you to, and, and get them to have a look at what you're currently doing. So the overall impression has to look good. Um, so RSPCA, that's here in Queensland. The one on the bottom there, you know, let us help you find your perfect match. Uh, it was this particular facility, it's written everywhere, um, so they're really passionate and everyone talks to it. You know, make it welcoming, it doesn't have to look like this, but it shouldn't have, you know, dog feces on the front door, <laughs> which by the way I've seen. Um, so yeah, certainly making it welcoming, making sure it's not all overgrown, your gardens, all those sort of simple things. You know, the messaging, whatever it is, is positive. Um, one facility, if you ever get to the US to look at, is San Diego SPCA. They have amazing messages everywhere you walk. There's, you know, signage all over the place. Really, really good, strong, positive messages. Uh, making it light and bright. It's good for us. It's good for the animals. A little bit of humour, creativity. Um, it's amazing. Everyone talks about this. When, when, I, uh, when I present that. Uh, and creating companions. So having a, an environment that people can see them in that environment, a bit like the cat one you saw earlier. So same thing here, people just being able to walk around and have a look. So you know, simple things like even having these areas where people can see them, dogs out playing. And welcoming and educating the community. Um, it's one thing, I'm not sure if Sharon's spoken about it, but that's one thing Oregon do extremely well, um, is their education programs. Um, I mean, when I toured their facility, there was, I don't know how many buses out in the car park of uh, children, of, of the elderly, um, really welcoming the whole community. And uh, it's one thing I really picked up in, or in uh, Portland was just how much of the uh, fabric of the society, the Oregon Humane Society was. It was uh, really quite exceptional. So just understanding that um, and how you can be involved in your community. So that's my conclusion. Thank you.